Hi, Benjamin, again. I just want to tell you that, do you hear me? Yeah. Um, I already started the, the live stream uh, on YouTube. Okay. But we will start the lecture in 10 minutes. So we still have just to get everybody around. Good? Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.
can you guys hear me? Very well. Okay, cool. All right. So, good evening, everyone. Um, on behalf of IARC, we welcome you all to the lecture of Benjamin Breton from Artificial to Synthetic Intelligence, Machine Cognition in the Wild. It is a moment of great pleasure for us to have him here with us here. Before we begin, I want to mention that um, we, we are going to record the, the lecture, and I kind of would like to ask you to keep your microphones muted and video cams off at all times during the lecture. And after the lecture, as usual, we will enter a Q&A session and accept your questions to Benjamin here in the Zoom chat, but also in YouTube streaming channel. So once again, we are extremely honored to have Benjamin as our guest professor for this evening event, which is a part of the IAC lecture series. Thank you, Benjamin, for your time. So quickly, I will introduce Benjamin. We are all familiar with his valuable contributions to the schools of architecture. Benjamin's work spans philosophy, architecture, computer science, and geopolitics. He's a, professor, he's a professor of visual arts at the University of California, San Diego. He's a program director of the Terraforming Program at the Strato Institute in Moscow. He's also a professor of digital design at the European Graduate School and visiting professor at SIARC and New York, uh, NYU Shanghai. He's the author of several books, including the most recent one, The Revenge of the Real, Politics for a Post-Pandemic World, which sees the COVID-19 pandemic as a crisis of political imagination and capacity in the West, and in response, argues on behalf of a positive biopolitics. It frames the pandemic as an invo involuntary experiment in comparative governance, one that, the, one that demonstrates the failures of populism and the need for an epidemiological view of society based on sensing modeling and collective organization. In the stack on software and sovereignty, Breton outlines a new geopolitical theory for the age of global computation and algorithmic governance. He proposes that different genres of planetary scale computation, earth layer, cloud layer, city layer, address layer, interface layer, user layer can be seen not as so many species evolving on their own, but as forming a coherent whole, an accidental megastructure that is both a computational infrastructure and a new governing architecture. The book plots an expansive interdisciplinary design brief for the stack to come as well. And as well as he was a, uh, he was a director of the, the previous uh, New Normal program at the Strap Institute, which was a speculative urbanism think tank investigating alternative urban conditions and futurities that focused on research and design for the city and explores opportunities posed by emerging technologies and geopolitical shifts for interdisciplinary design practice. So now I stop here and pass the virtual stage to our guest. Please, everyone, welcome Professor Benjamin Breton. Thank you very much. Um, and thanks very much for the, for the invitation to speak with you this evening. Let me just first begin by uh, sharing my portion of my screen here with you, uh, and then we can begin. Um, and nice to see you, Bart, as well. I haven't, we haven't seen each other in a while, but nice, nice to see you here. Um, yes, really happy that you're here. Thank you. My, my pleasure. I'd much rather be with you in person, for sure, uh, and visit, in, visit Innsbruck. Um, my, uh, so my remarks this evening, um, artificial to synthetic intelligence, machine cognition in the wild, um, are based on some recent, more recent work, some old, some recent work on machine intelligence, artificial intelligence, and synthetic intelligence, which are, uh, I'll try to convince you, are not all the same thing, um, but a little bit on the interrelationship between them and some of their implications for design uh, and also for philosophy and science uh, and other, uh, other related, related concerns. Uh, I will, let me begin then with some few sort of provocations or statements. Um, one is that there are many ways to define artificial and many more ways to define intelligence. Um, one of the current projects that I'm working on uh, as part of my, my role as the as director of the Center for AI and Culture at NYU Shanghai is a, a book that will be coming out in a few years and perhaps later this year, I think early next year, a book called Machine Decision is Not Final, 
China and the History of the Future of Artificial Intelligence, which edited by Anna Greenspan and Bogna Honyer. Uh, and one of the things that this book is looking at is particularly the ways in which notions of artificiality per se, uh, intelligence as such is, is conceptualized very differently in the Chinese context, historically uh, and in the sort of long-term history, more recent history, uh, post-war, the post-war history of cybernetics in China um, more generally, but that this question of artificiality as such is, is, is something that defines, has defined in many ways um, the lens through which we see what AI is and what AI might be. And indeed, the question of intelligence is, um, is, is, is as well. So suffice to say, I see this question of trying to comprehend both of these, both of these terms, both as a uh, let's say a philosophical and anthropological problematic, that is these ideas are, have been defined differently in different cultures, but also as a scientific one, that there are things that we know scientifically about how cognition and intelligence might work um, that we can and cannot superimpose onto machine intelligence quite so, quite so easily. So more pragmatically then, uh, and in thinking about what not just AI is what one of the previous discussions I had with some of the students, they had reminded me of a quote they had written where I said something along the lines of, um, instead of trying to figure out first what AI is and therefore what it can do, perhaps we start with what it can do uh, and there and from that try to derive what, what it is. But at the very least at this point in time, uh, it's not clear what AI, or let's just say, at the very least, machine intelligence actually is, and certainly not clear, but ultimately in the long run, what it is, what it is for. Um, and part of the reason I, I raised this point is that many of the you now perhaps conventional critiques of AI um, are ones that are uh, perhaps miss this point in, in a way in which they allow for quite appropriate and uh, incisive critiques of many of the uh, social and political effects of the uses of machine intelligence in the present moment, but then make the next move by indicating either explicitly or implicitly that these pernicious uses of machine intelligence are in essence what AI is, that AI and these this particular early mobilization of it um, are intrinsic to one another, the historically intrinsic, politically intrinsic, morally and ethically intrinsic. And I would want to suggest that we do not make that mistake and to de-link these in some ways, or to put it differently, that AI is currently used by used for both very smart things and very stupid things. Um, and that perhaps more importantly, its ultimate purposes, I mean, long-term purposes in the, century, in the decades to come, in the centuries to come of what machine intelligence is, what it does, how human intelligence continues to evolve in relationship to it are maybe at this point largely undiscovered. That is, I should hope in a way take that as part of the good news. And that is to put it more Specifically, in relation to my earlier comment, don't confuse the implement, implementation for ontology. Uh, don't make the mistake that what AI is used for at this present moment is what AI is. And so um, I, I remember a student a couple of years ago who was um, concerned with some of my remarks on this and was talking about the a book called um, Algorithms of Oppression by Sophia Noble. And they were, they had, they were convinced that the name of the book was not algorithms of oppression, but algorithms are oppression. And I tried to convince them that in fact, that wasn't the name of the book or even the argument of the book, but they were convinced that it was. Uh, and this is, I suppose, the where we find ourselves and what at one point of my concern. Now, longer term, we should, in thinking about the longer term emergence of machine intelligence, we is to think of this perhaps on the temporal, in, in relation at least to some of the temporal scales of natural intelligence. Natural intelligence, what we might call natural intelligence, which is human, it's animal, it's arguably, you know, primarily, uh, you know, in its most advanced forms, mammalian, but it's also arguably 
a kind of vegetal or, or, or at least you know, distributed among different kinds of life forms in different ways. But the na natural intelligence took billions of years to develop. Uh, millions of years more recently, um, Homo habilis, our, the, our first, <clears throat> you know, as far as we know, some of our earliest tool using ancestors from just a few million years ago, um, you know, yesterday in geologic terms. Um, and it's only been really tens of thousands of years since the, the, uh, you know, the cognitive revolution the neo and the, the ways in which the, our overgrown neocortex allowed us to produce what we recognize as Neolithic cultures, Neolithic art, um, uh, written language, agriculture, so forth and so on. All of this is, is in the broad scheme of things, um, a kind of, you know, instantaneous, relatively instantaneous. Um, and so an evolutionary perspective on machine intelligence should provide, should drive the way in which we think about its long-term emergence. That is, we've had, the uh, at, from a planetary perspective, we've seen the phenomenon of, 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 of organic, you know, organic, creatures, animals, mammals, hominids in particular, produce natural intelligence over a long period of time. Now we have the phenomenon of by which um, some of those hominids that namely us have produced, have taken different kinds of rocks and metals and folded them in particular ways in order and run electricity through them to produce something like uh, uh, mineral intelligence. We might suggest that that mineral intelligence will have its own uh, its own evolutionary arc that is uh, that, that, um, perhaps on similar time scales. So um, let me then locate this to a certain extent in contrast to the uh, what has become what the, the Western sort of orthodox history of AI, um, which is. Uh, certainly not the only history of the notion of artificiality or of, certainly not of intelligence or the one that might inform how we think about the future of AI. But this is, as you know, this is Alan Turing. Alan Turing is, I, you know, I think a heroic figure if anyone is. And so my, my remarks in critical of, of that are critical remarks I'm about to make are, are not meant to disparage him really in, 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 in any way. But one of the interesting things, I, and also I think for design, designers is the ways in which, um, particularly in the West, the histories of artificial intelligence and the history of the philosophy of artificial intelligence have been so deeply intertwined that the, the, the history of the technology, the history of the engineering, and the history of the Gdansk experiment, the thought experiments around, a, uh, around AI and the more formal philosophy form a kind of double helix, um, one informing the other. In, in, in important and interesting ways. And, and indeed, we hopefully see that continuing now and into the future. Now, one of the questions, one of the things I'd like to critique for a moment is the, um, the way in which I think a basic misinterpretation of Turing's famous thought experiment from 1948, 1950s essay, the, uh, the on computing, uh, uh, on computing intel machine intelligence, um, his famous Turing test uh, based on the, the imitation game. Um, imitation game, as you know, was a kind of party game where uh, you'd have two people would go in a room, one was a man, one was a woman, and then a third player would try to, would ask them to write down questions, uh, to, answer, to respond to questions in written form, and would try to figure out which one of them was a, a man and which one was a woman, player A being the woman. Uh, and so player A, the woman was in essence, was trying to fool the other player C, the one who's doing the guessing. And so you had a player A was a woman pretending to be a man, pretending to be a woman. Player B was a man pretending to be a woman, or perhaps a man pretending to be a woman, pretending to be a man, pretending to be a woman, and so forth and so on. Um, but the player was then asked to uh, try to deduce which is which. Now, if you read Turing's test more test, the original Turing test closely, he suggests, what if a computer takes the place of player A? So in this case, the computer is trying to take place, trying to pass as a human, but I guess more specifically, also trying to pass as a woman, um, which at, at any anyway, rate, the question around passing and Turing's own biography, uh, as you probably aware, is one that's perhaps more um, uh, a, 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 a bit, a bit uh, poignant uh, kind of kind of connection. Turing, of course, was a gay man who, in, in 
England in the, in, at, the, at this time where this was Ill, uh, illegal and spent his whole life kind of passing them. So this question of passing um, becomes uh, central to this to this story. Now, the question though, and here is the Voigt Kant empathy test from Ridley Scott's Blade Runner based on the Turing test. Um, one of the things that the replicants in Blade Runner don't have is empathy. Empathy being, um, you know, in a certain sense, intrinsic to the performance of passing in some way. You have to imagine, you have to model, the person who is doing the passing has to model the mind of who they're trying to fool in order to perform what they that other person expects to see. And indeed, that's what the AI is asked to do in the Turing test model. The AI is asked to pass as a human uh, and so that the human might recognize the AI as intelligent. And so here we see the limitation, not only of passing more generally, but of, of this particular way of defining AI, of defining AI as a form of a, a, a form of expressive cognition that is we will recognize as intelligent to the extent that it it seems to it performs thinking the way that humans think that humans think that if we were to recognize its anthropomorphic qualities that this anthropomorphism guarantees its underlying intelligence and I you would see, you see ways in which this represents a a kind of problem. Now, to be fair, in Turing's essay, and I think this is an important point, he offers this distinction, this ability to, to pass, um, not as a necessary condition of intelligence, that is, but rather as a sufficient condition. That is, if, as a sufficient condition, if the computer can pass, then he says, can we, can we not say that there must be something going on here? There must be some kind of intelligence here. What he's not saying is that if it cannot pass, then it is not intelligent. That's a necessary condition. And in fact, unfortunately, the way in which the Turing test has been generally popularized, it's taken as this necessary condition that to the extent to which the AI is anthropomorphic, to the extent to which the AI resembles human intelligence, this guarantees its quality of intelligence per se. What I wish to make clear, if one takeaway from this talk, it's that this intense anthropomorphization of AI is the condition by which we would recognize AI and choose to uh, manipulate it and intervene in it and design it and co-evolve with it is a drastic mistake on our part. It, 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 um, it prevents us from recognizing what machine intelligence actually is in its both, its, uh, it, its positive and negative potential. So let me also then suggest that one of the, the things that, that what I think the perspective I'm offering then should account for then at least a couple of other related different understandings. One would recognize an intelligence cognition, but more specifically intelligence is always distributed through multiple positions and forms of life, both similar and dissimilar to one another. There is no one single neuroanatomical disposition that has a privileged monopoly on how to think uh, intelligently. Um, or at the very least at the isomorph, the neurological isomorphs between different kinds of creatures um, suggest that there is a distribution of intelligence in different kinds of ways. What might qualify, what, what might qualify general intelligence um, is not duty bound to any particular species or phylum. Um, for example, the ability of any organism, however primitive to map its own surroundings, particularly in relationship to friend or food or foe, is a primordial abstraction from which we don't graduate so much as develop into something more uh, into something more elaborate, like what we recognize as reason in its local local variations. So, like protozoa and cilia feeling about to find out what's out there, humans looking and tasting and imagining patterns and so forth. All of these forms, today's forms of AI are sometimes augmented by various forms of machine cognition, machine sensation, machine vision that allow them to see and sense the world out there and to abstract the forms of a mechanically embodied intelligence. That is, they are embodied. AI is not disembodied. It is embodied. It is intelligent because it is embodied through different forms of uh, of, of informational inputs and informational processing. Um, now, 
one of the th we this is not to say to sort of denigrate the the specific accomplishments of human sapience. One, I, I to to the contrary, um, uh, I think there is a fundamental difference between sentience and sapience. One of the you know I would refer you to the work of Wilfred Szilard um, on on this point. Um, and the ability for a, a form of mind that is able to recursively conceptualize its, its itself as mind um, is different than simple sentience. Um, but and that one emerges that one necessarily emerges uh, from the other. At the same time, as uh, my image here tries to make clear, is that this capacity, the sentience, the sapience itself, is a physical material phenomenon. One of the ways in which the, the earth, if you want to take it in a geologic sense, uh, the earth over a period of millions of years, tens of thousands of years more recently, but millions of years in, 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 uh, in, in more local terms, has managed to fold itself in a particular way into the shape of primate brains, and namely homo, homo sapien brains, to form, to constitute a form of matter that is our our brain that is capable of this feat of self-introspection and capable of other kinds of feats, including deducing how old the planet is itself. Um, it is a remarkable thing for a planet to do, but it is also a physical and material fact. All right, let me switch then back to this question of the artificial. And let's talk a little bit about what we may mean and not mean by the term artificial. Um, one way that we have thinking about the term artificial may have to do with the question of what's called um, anomalous regularity, anomalous regularity within a system. Let me show you this picture and we'll come back to it the other in a second. So as I was showing this to the students yesterday as well, it's easy for you to deduce, this is a picture you've probably seen of a forest in Japan. It's easy for all of us to pretty much point at what part of the forest was planted by humans and what part of the forest grew organically because we see this anomalous regularity um, within the distribution such that the artificiality, we recognize the artificiality in essence as, age, uh, as sapient cognitive agency recognizing itself through its own external effects. But it is this, and, and much to say about that, but more specifically this question of artificial anomalous regularity, also refers to, includes ways in which, for example, SETI, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, it, it takes down lots and lots of garbled noise coming in from the universe. When it finds, however, something within that noise that is anomalously regular, um, such as a rhythm or beat uh, or some mathematical regularity, it might introduce that this is also a signal that it, and, and that therefore this is artificial that there's a recognizable agency behind this and that the constitution by its artificiality or for example what used to be called thunderstones the stone axes that are periodically upturned across Europe um, with a, the trained eye is able to look at one of these stones and differentiate by, by observing the anomalous regular features on the side of the stone is able to differentiate which, which one of these is a three million year old hand ax, uh, a tool used by one of our ancestors and which one of these is just a rock uh, by looking at the anomalous regularity and seeing the anomalous regularity, recognizing the agency thereby. Now back to this picture of the anomalous regularity. Now there's another way in which we, that the question of the artificial is, it, we, we, we think through and that is in relation to um, Herbert Simon's famous Sciences of the Artificial book, late 1968, in which Simon makes a differentiation between the artificial and the synthetic, the artificial and the synthetic. So for Simon, the artificial, so in the example that he uses between the artificial and the synthetic, he poses in terms of a diamond. So um, as this sort of famous, famous example that he uses, an artificial diamond, an artificial would refer to something that is merely resembles an original in some superficial way, such as a cheap glass diamond. It looks like a diamond, but materially, physically, it really isn't a diamond. It's just a piece of glass, but it fools us to think it, it seems like it is. Whereas the synthetic is a genuine and meaningful version of something that was, deliber however, deliberately created, such as a laboratory-grown diamond, 
that is molecularly identical to a natural one, but had been, but was nevertheless made. And so this distinction between the artificial and the synthetic is one that I think is quite poignant and certainly one that would allow us to differentiate um, conceptually what we mean by an artificial intelligence from a synthetic intelligence. An artificial intelligence would be something by Simon's, but in, using this sort of Simonian framework is one that isn't really intelligent, it just seems intelligent. It just performs intelligence in a way that we misrecognize it as being intelligence versus a synthetic intelligence, which the two connotations of the synthetic, which I'll talk to you about. The first one would be then based on Simon, a form of intelligence that was deliberately composed, but which is also genuinely intelligent in some way. And of course, it's the latter that is much more interesting to us than the former. So let me then use this example of language as a way of talking through um, some of the possible differences uh, between the two, uh, artificial languages and what is in later uh, natural language processing. So artificial languages have a long history, pre, the pre before comp that, that before they merge with computation in any kind of sense from um, things like Esperanto, uh, the attempt to build a kind of global language. Bahasa Indonesian is, a, is an artificial language um, constructed to operate in a certain way. There's Klingon, of course, but we'll, we'll set that aside for, for, for the moment. There, there is a moment also with, in the late 1940s, early 1950s, where the idea of a programming language is specified, that the process by which you would, um, the, the systems and syntaxes by which you would program a computer and give an instruction set is formally identified and called a language. Um, and that that it probably initially a kind of metaphorization of programming as a language comes to take on increasingly complex forms of grammar and syntax within modern programming languages such that it's possible for the German media theorist Frederick Hitler to eventually suggest that to be a truly cosmopolitan person, one must be able to speak at least one natural language and one artificial language uh, at, at, the, at, at, this, at, this same, at the same time. Um, the, so, but the question then, let me set that, the, 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 the construction of artificial language aside for a second, but also give you, use, use language, however, to give you an example of what we might mean by artificial intelligence in the Simonian sense, that is something that appears to be intelligent, but actually really isn't. And that's the famous example of Eliza by uh, Joseph Wiesenbaum, um, of which I assume many of you are probably familiar. Eliza was one of the first robust chatbots um, designed by the uh, but designed by Wiesenbaum MIT in 1966 based on Rogerian psychotherapy, which I won't go and bother to define for you, but you understand it's a kind of a sort of emotional therapeutic technique that is one of the aspects of the of this technique is is the asking of questions and actually sort of prompting people to question their statements and to ask them to unpack these more specifically. So you see an example of this here. Eliza says, is something troubling you? Men are all alike. It's like, what is the connection do you suppose? They're always bugging us about something. Can you think of a specific example? Well, my boyfriend made me come here. Is it important to you that your boyfriend made you come here? So basically what you see here is that anything that the person says, the chatbot will simply kind of reframe, re mix the words around a little bit and ask it back to them in the form of a, of a prompt question to ask them to go along. Now, to Wiesenbaum's horror, um, many of his graduate students just sat the word, became just entranced with this. And he tells the story of, I, I think, a, an admin person in his office who, who basically stayed in the office overnight, as I recall the story, just pouring their heart out to this chatbot about their childhood, about their hopes and dreams, and all the rest of this kind of thing is, this is a, if you look at the, the code for Liza, it's like, it's a couple pages of code at, at most that basically just takes, takes the words, scrambles them around and raises in the forms of a question. But the attribution of intelligence, and indeed in this case, the attribution of empathy and the attribution of insight that use that people may have in relationship to this 
in a certain sense, doesn't make it any, the fact that it doesn't actually know you're there or care about you or anything other than just being a, literally a little script for jumbling words around didn't matter. The attribution became the basis for, by which people would, 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 would structure this as well. So I raised this issue both to identify a kind of artificial intelligence, but also in a way to suggest that just because the intelligence is artificial doesn't mean that it's illegitimate or somehow not real or that because this attribution effect itself is real. Um, but it is what we might call a, a placebo intelligence in that way through this attribution. Now that's different, I think, than some of the more um, uh, advanced link, link chatbots that we might sort of work with. This is one based on the, Mina, the Mina bot that uh, the Google the Google research is, has been developing um, that's based on the GLAM NLP model, um, which I'll talk about in a, talk about in a moment. Um, and one of the things that you see here is that they the bot is not just repeating back to you things. It's not just it's and it's also not just where a lot of bots were where you do sort of hard code responses. Like if someone says I like cows, then it will respond with this word. Like if you ask Siri, for example, weird questions like Siri, do you believe in God? Apple has programmed Siri to respond with certain canned responses that, you know, and so forth and so on. That's not what's going on here. It's actually seeming to kind of understand what you're saying and also to understand how one, how, you know, it might respond to this in a kind of vernacular speech. Um, in, a in, a, in a speech that is, I mean, literally in the specific sense of vernacular, that's specific to the linguistic context of the conversation. It can tell jokes. Uh, it can, seems to sort of know what, whether something is funny or not. Um, and one of the sort of the tests that this, that some of the new ones are able to test or what we talked about yesterday called the Winograd schema based on uh, from Terry Winograd, the early the AI researcher and the advisor to Sergey and Larry uh, when they made Google. Um, in, that, it, it, in that, based on Dreyfus's Heideggerian critique of AI, that because the AI is supposedly disembodied, it doesn't have any um, firsthand understanding of the world. It's not really able to under comprehend sentences in such a way that it can't pass these kind of schemas. So for example, the trophy doesn't fit into the brown suitcase because it's too large. Okay, so we know how we know what trophies and suitcases are. So we would know that the it refers to the trophy. Trophy doesn't fit into the brown suitcase because it's too small. We would know that the it refers to a suitcase. An AI that doesn't know what really know what trophies and suitcases are like has never used one would not know what the it is referring to. Modern chatbots that are based on sort of lar much, much larger and more sophisticated kind of NLP models have no problem with Winograd schema. That is, they seem to actually understand how the world works in a certain way. And one might make the argument that they, they represent a nascent form of synthetic intelligence. Importantly, there, it, this, is, this is a human-like human intelligence in the extent to which it is trained on human language and it's trained on language that is itself trained on human experience, for sure. But because the AI is embodied in the world differently, because it processes this information differently, it, it is nevertheless a different kind of intelligence and one that we would want to ad address and work with as such. Um, another practical example of NLP that I was sort of fascinated by was based on a recent visit to the Sony's AI lab in Tokyo, where um, they are working on various robot generated languages, languages for robots to talk to other robots. Um, in this case, this is a, a case study they showed us where the robot on the left is going to tell, is telling the robot on the right to pick up one of those yellow things and stick it on top of the white box. Okay, that's what he's, that's what the guy's telling the other guy. Um, now, the, one of the things that the researchers were quite fascinated by was that um, how well this worked, uh, that the kind of syntax was able to evolve, but also that very quickly that the robots developed a, 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 that the language evolved so quickly 
and that it, it performed quite well, that the one robot, that the, the robots were able to communicate much more sophisticated things to one another, but that the program, that the researchers very quickly lost track of what the hell anyone was saying, that the, the syntax evolved this, evolved this quickly. Now I raise this as a question to the point to which I also want to think to point to this that why language I think is important here to the co to synthetic intelligence, but also to the way in which the evolution synthetic intelligence is important to the evolution of language, and through the evolution of language, therefore to the evolution of intelligence. So my point earlier about thinking through this on more evolutionary terms. Now thinking about. Um, uh, 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 let's uh, my, my incompetent spelling here. The um, thinking about this in terms of uh, attribution and the attribution errors that we might wake might might wake um, that we might make for natural language. Those of us who learn to speak a natural language, we have comprehension and competency within this language. We understand what trophies and suitcases are. We know how to use these words as trophies and suitcases, but we don't really have a very good model of how we use language, that is, our brain doesn't really understand how our brain works. Our brain doesn't understand how our brain works. We've gotten a little bit better more recently. We figured out what a neocortex does. We understand a little bit how neurons are prediction machines, but this is all very recent and certainly comes after our ability to comprehend things and have competency. So with, we have, naturally we have comprehension and competency without a model. For natural language processing, on the other hand, the model is the competency, like its ability to, uh, uh, its its ability to to I'm gonna fix this as bothering me. Uh, its ability to um, to be competent with the language is based on the construction of the model. Uh, I'm sorry, um, is basically on construction of the of the uh, of the model through which it. Um, it works and through which it models in which it actually operates these language structures together. But it has no, comp but it doesn't necessarily have comprehension uh, in the Winograd schema sense of comprehension. It doesn't necessarily know what trophy suitcases are, but arguably in a sense, increasingly does. Now, one of the essential of the issues that we have is in terms of the attribution error is then it can, we confuse competency for comprehension. That is, we, with ELISA, we might, we confuse the fact that it, seems to have competency in responding to our questions, competency in understanding what we mean, at least we attribute it to this way, we then presume that it has comprehension, that it has comprehension of what we mean and what we think and what we feel. We are confusing the comprehension and competency. I just want to raise this as maybe the, the crux of the um, uh, attribution error. Now, <clears throat> let me then talk for a moment uh, quickly um, about the some of the controversies around large natural language processing models. You're probably familiar with the recent um, the the very unfortunate firing of <clears throat> some of the people in the AI ethics groups at, at Google that were working on this and had published a piece that was critical of very very large models. Uh, and was arguing for smaller, higher curated language models. Um, and I think to some extent, I, I think some of their criticism was well-founded, I think other, but I think at the same time, um, the role of large models and foundational models is uh, uh, actually, it has benefits and even ethical benefits, not just technological benefits that maybe they had, um, uh, that, that I don't think they gave enough weight to in, in many regards. I don't think the pros and cons are quite, um, so simple. So a very, very large model, um, such as GPT-3 or the GLAM model that, that, that Google now, has now come out with, which is uh, uh, over a, a trillion parameters, um, basically are trained on, let's say, the entire internet, the whole corpus of, of published human, of, of human communication. Because it's Google, it's not just the public internet, but it's you know, trained on everything our emails and all kinds of stuff and all kinds of things that we allow for this research to be done on, which means that it comes with all of the, it actually, in a way, actually represents um, all of the biases within human language, all the biases within how we talk to one another, how we talk about each other, how we represent each other, um, 
it is human. It is built on the sort of structures of human languages as it is, with all its strangeness, with all its inadvertent misspellings. Um, as we saw above, all the weird sort of errors within the system by which how the system um, how the system evolves. Uh, it is language as it is. Um, and as opposed to the smaller models, which they're arguing for, which were meant to allow for a kind of more a curation, let's say, I won't call it a censorship, I'll call it a, because I think that's unfair, I'll call it a curation of the training data uh, and, a, and the reinforcement processes within this that would allow for a correction, let's say, of the direction of language, a correction of the evolution of, of, of language and how it is that people are represented, how it is that we speak to one another in such a way that uh, it will be, the system will be disposed towards, uh, certain, uh, to, towards certain forms of language, certain representations, certain associations um, in one way or another. For example, if, if the language tends to identify doctors as men because there are that's how they're spoken about that you could change this in such a way that the doctor becomes uh, gender neutral now obviously there are tremendous uh, advantages to this particularly because we're building nlp systems are increasingly infrastructural systems and to the extent to which those infrastructural systems um, are ones that are supposed to be uh, genuinely neutral uh, or as neutral as possible in terms of how it is that people might use them to improve their lives that that that, that kind of representational uh, correction and neutrality would have its would have its advantages um, however at the same time one of the things that we see is that there are also one of the other issues that was raised in the piece had to do with the energy costs of large natural language processing models which in some of the earlier versions of this gpt2 for example they're extraordinarily uh, energy intensive and the argument was meant just that the training of these models is energy intensive kinds of ways is a is a waste of resources I would argue that actually that language itself is, and the role of AI in the modeling of language is a, is a fundamental and intrinsically valuable scientific pursuit, that to the extent to which language becomes, comes, is constitutive of human intelligence, human intelligence and sapience being the model form of sapience that, we, that has thus evolved, that the capacity of this intelligence to, in essence, externalize itself and finally produce that and to produce that model of itself in such a way that it might learn from its, its, that exterior modeling has intrinsic value. Like if we're going to spend the green, if we're going to spend the energy and the greenhouse gases on, uh, on, on computational processes in general, I vote for natural language processing models over cat videos any day in the week. Now, small models, um, tend to, if you have everyone building a lot of small models, this arguably will actually, each of the small models takes less um, carbon and energy to produce for sure, but multiple small models represents um, potential inefficiencies in that kind of uses. Still, important arguments to be made about like, if you have small models, you can also have a kind of heterogeneity and diversity within these model systems, as opposed to the foundation, larger foundational models um, with which we have to work with as well. So it, there's, it's, it's certainly uh, important considerations in, in, in every regard. Now, uh, when I talk about foundational models, what I mean are things like GPT-3 or upcoming, you know, upcoming variations of this GPT-4 or the, the older BERT model or the GLAM model. So, the, the GPT-3 model that you're probably more familiar with, it's, it's spot, it is, it is eerily successful in its ability to predict text used for, it's been used for writing novels, writing screenplays and so forth and so on, its ability to predict the, the, next, the next bodies of text. Um, one of the most fascinating uses of GPT-3 more recently that I've become, that I've been, uh, that some of the, um, colleagues of mine have been in, involved with is the use of GPT-3 for drug discovery. That is the using the extent to which genetic languages, the strings of the, the, the DNA, the, the amino acid strings within DNA is also a linguistic form. Using GPT-3 to predict the next, uh, the next strings of DNA within a sequence and using this as a way to hone areas for possible uh, other techniques for drug discovery. So it turns out that 
genetic language and natural language can be artificialized through the common system um, in, this, in, in this particular way, which I find totally fascinating. Um, GPT-3, I should say, was about is the one that you, that's about 175 billion parameter system. The GLAM model, which is now, now live, is about 1.2 trillion uh, parameters, um, and so several times bigger than the GPT-3 model, um, and is one that is in the process of being rolled out onto through tensor process, and one way or another will be driving all the, the um, NLP on your phone. So this is what I mean by this as an infrastructural and foundational, foundational system. Those of you who are interested in this question around NLP as a, what, as a foundational model, language as a, as a physical part of cyber infrastructure, the key paper you're going to want to look at is this one from the Stanford's AI group on, on the opportunities and risks of foundational models, Pepe Lee's group uh, and so forth, um, based on the Stanford Institute for uh, Human-Centered Artificial Intelligence um, around, the, around this as well. Um, so a couple other uses of this around uh, that I, I find quite interesting. Um, one of the things that I, part of the dialogue that I've been having with the research group is around the use of <clears throat> the use of, uh, of, of one-shot and few-shot learning techniques for um, learning uh, dying languages. That every year there are uh, languages that essentially go extinct, like species go extinct. Um, there are numerous minority languages and so forth and so on. And some of these languages are, as indicated here, sort of critically endangered. Um, with one-shot and few-shot learning, uh, you can teach AIs to, in essence, learn and model these languages relatively comprehensively without a lot of data. Uh, you don't need years and years of data. They can do it pretty quickly and sort of think about this in relationship to something like the Svalbard Seed Bank, which is an archive of genetic, uh, the sort of genetic heritage. Um, I, the project to think of this, the, sort of this archiving of languages as a kind of ontological heritage. Uh, semantic heritage um, is, is a purpose to which we're trying to sort of direct this. Um, one of the other also examples of the, the, this I, I, I quite like was um, uh, is, is a research project group on, on the, for the internet, what we, what we have termed internet of natural language processing things. That is teaching objects to speak natural language and using this as, a, as an IoT protocol. Um, so you can think about this is that what's called the seventh protocol problem or that you, you develop IoT protocols, but you have multiple protocols that don't all talk to each other. And so you have to build a kind of meta protocol so they all, they can do this, but someone else builds another and to build a different meta protocol. So someone else has to build the meta meta protocol and you see how it kind of goes on and on and on and on and on. So the idea of this is you just teach the chips to speak English or Chinese. Uh, and so they're talking to each other in natural language, which is obviously more auditable, um, is more uh, is is more scalable, you know, in a certain sense scalable, um, and doesn't require this kinds of uh, meta uh, meta protocols. One of the things that it would involve, though, is increasingly, like we saw with these guys here, uh, probably a strange evolution of that natural language itself. That is, if if most of the speakers of English, let's say, are not human are not only not from England or America, but are not even humans, are machines. Then the ultimate, the ultimate evolution of that language itself is, will be uncertain, and it would likely be that in a few years, the English words that we would learn to be speaking might be derived from the way in which the objects had been speaking English. We would learn English from them as much as they would learn it from us in some way. Um, so let's see, I want to make sure that we have some time, uh, that we leave some time for discussion, uh, which would be the more interesting part of this as well. So let me skip ahead here and, and um, I'll end with some closing thoughts, a different notion of the synthetic and synthetic intelligence. So another connotation of the synthetic would have to do not with, not in the Simonian sense of, of deliberately made, but genuine. But would have to do with as in synthesis, as in the synthesis of human intelligence and machine intelligence. And let me give you one of the examples. I talked about this with the students yesterday. But let me give you an example that was based on one of our projects of the terraforming program at Strelka. Um, and this project was based on the uh, uh, the match between the, what you're looking at was the match between Lisa Dole uh, and AlphaGo, quite famous at this point. You you know sort of about this. 
Um, in the second game, move 37, the, the AlphaGo makes this highly strange and unexpected move uh, that everyone was the, very surprised by. It seemed like it was a glitch, that the thing was broken. Uh, Sadol himself recognized this was not the case, but then you know, eventually the, it, 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 the machine won the game by making a move that in essence no one had made before. All the thousands of years people have been playing Go, no one had thought to see the board in this way. Um, and it suggested perhaps that yes, there is somebody home or that the AI at the very least is capable of novelty, not just regurgitation. Now, the form of synthetic intelligence that I would want to point to, I think is a more interesting move, is not the one the AI made, it's the one that Sadol made the, the next day, where he came back with this equally strange move, move 78 in the next game, which was equally unexpected and creative. Um, and Sadol afterwards said that he never would, and he ended up winning the game. And Sadol himself said that he never would have made this move if he had, if the computer hadn't made this move and he had learned to see the board in a different way than he had seen it his whole life as a go master. It allowed him to see it this way. So in essence, this is a, an example of the kind of human plus machine intelligence, not human or machine, not human versus machine, but human and machine intelligence that will allow for forms of pattern recognition and, and play that would be uh, that we would want to look for. So one of the projects that we did um, that was looking at this is basically by Joel Fear, Nicole Fitzgerald, and Lara Shinkarova um, called Sites of the Synthetic. I'm playing you the fast forward version here as well. The whole 20 minute movie is available on the website it is looking at ways and like what are the actual uh, structural and physical and locative constraints by which again, the sites of this kind of, that we can sort of locate and cite in the rules system by which these, what they call operators, constraints, and operations, the rule systems by which these moments of synthesis, synthesis might be possible. Um, and long, it's a rather complicated theory that they devised here as well, but long story short, think about the ways in which the Go board constitutes this miniaturized toy world where these with very specific kinds of rules, very specific kinds of loss functions of what you're supposed to do to win the game um, that allows for, because it is so constrained and so uh, sort of miniaturized, it allows for this space of communication and interaction and collaboration and interpretation between two very unlike forms of, uh, unlike forms of intelligence. Uh, and that is in fact the, the kind of, the, where we, the kinds of things that we would be that we would be looking for. Okay, let me end then um, with a little more sort of bigger picture thought on some of this, of, of this relationship between AI, some of these discussions, the emergence of natural intelligence, and the rest of this, and, and more broadly in relationship to the bigger thesis of planetary scale computation, which I, which I drew a little bit earlier. Um, and to provide a little bit of, I don't know if caution is the right word, but a little bit of um, context. To measure, to measure the way to planetary scale computation includes a sober reckoning with the physical costs of its sprawling infrastructures, which includes differentiating, as I say, essential purpose from trivial exploit. And ultimately, however, pondering the price of intelligence itself, the price of intelligence itself. So in the context that I think really matters most, the cultivation of synthetic intelligence that is capable of forms of collaboration with our most virtuous ambitions, our most virtuoso expressions is precious. It is a pursuit worth having. The syntheses they portend um, are however, only available if we pursue them with the resolve and clarity and, and clear mindedness um, about their high costs. Now, any refusal, I would say, to refusal of the costs of, any refusal or acceptance of the cost of synthetic intelligence, but also consider the price of natural intelligence. It's not only symbiotic social cooperation, but also the tumultuous mountains of gore that led our common ancestors from Olduvai Gorge to Gobekli Tepe, 
to, and to the literate there, from there to the literate cultures of Mesopotamia, East Asia, and Mesoamerica. Our deepest values, I think, are at stake in the questioning of, of, of intelligence own emergence. In the very long term, in the very in the very long term evolution of intelligence, at human, animal, machine, and hybrids, a fundamental purpose of the organization and complexification of life itself is at stake. Life complexifies itself through the emergence of its own capacities for recursive self-modeling in the form of intelligence. And if so, now that intelligence has begins to migrate to the inorganic substrate of silicon, what planetary teeth do you pretend? Um, here, of course, I just started to sort of add to our mix here as well. We've probably seen this, the globs of human brain that seem to grow, that grow in a dish coaxed into forming something like rudimentary eyes, which respond to light by sending signals back to the rest of brain tissue, suggesting perhaps that this emergence of sensation and ultimately recurrent sensation that informs a modeling of an external world, and then subsequently a modeling of an internal world um, has a, a kind of evolutionary dynamism, a convergent evolutionary thrust that is, um, that is uh, of which we are, we, are, we are thrown up, which we are thrown into and thrown up thereby. Intelligence doesn't live in a, Petri now, to say is that the intelligence, therefore, it's sort of massively distributed. It doesn't live in a petri dish or in a laboratory or inside a single skull. It lives out in the open. It lives in and as our cities. A city is not just architecture plus dwellers. It is an artificial environment par excellence. And as the designer and programmer Ben Servini says, said, the city is perhaps our longest continuous process that humans have created introducing synthetic computational intelligence into urban systems augments existing forms of embodied sensing intelligence and thereby includes novel qualities. The point being that the intelligence is already there. The introduction of, of artificial computational intelligence augments what is there. It doesn't introduce intelligence in the first place. Of course, there have been different ways in which to sort of model this, this logic of intelligence. You can see this artificiality. I'm reminded of the Gokuten Soku, the, one of the first uh, sort of historically sort of, uh, major uh, Japanese robots made in Osaka in the 1920s by Makoto Nishimura. Nishimura was appalled by the mechanistic uh, figuration of the humanoid robots in Karl Kopchak's uh, Rossum's Universal Robot, the play from which robots come from. And he tried to design and conceive of a form of automation that manifested what he saw as the most noble and fragile aspects of human culture, complete with intricate facial expressions, the ability to transcribe poetry, um, and so forth. And I, I was reminded of, of Boku Tensoku um, when I visited a factory in Shenzhen that makes many factories, but one in particular that makes happens to make phones for and cases for phone, phone cases that was set up in such a way that. Um, employs many robots and people working side by side. And I was struck at this moment of this visit by a kind of unexpected feeling, a kind of serenity. Um, the, the mood was calm. It wasn't frantic. Uh, it wasn't Tayloristic. It wasn't Chaplin in modern times at all. Some things are moving quickly, other things moving quietly. Other things were quite still as if waiting their turn. It didn't, again, it didn't feel like a factory in the Charlie, Chaplin's, Charlie, Charlie Chaplin sense. It felt much more like a garden of machines in the Richard Brodigan sense. Um, and I remarked to a colleague at the time that I liked very much to spend time in a cafe like this, that it would make for a very lovely kind of public gathering spot. And, and as I spoke originally kind of as a joke, I realized that really this isn't a joke that the present, or the present locus of automation in the factory will inevitably spill out into the city. And when it does, we should be aware of the, that this simple fact that automation creates a particular kind of ambiance. It's more than form following function. It is functionalism becoming a delicate formation, uh, or at least it, or at least it could be. Um, on that same, on a similar trip, when we went from there to Japan, this is well, relatively recent, we visited the Dawn Cafe 
uh, project in, in Tokyo, uh, a cafe where severely handicapped persons um, control remotely control um, service robots that that serve you in the in the cafe as well. Begin to think about this larger expanded space of of automation, particularly in relationship to the disabled body. Um, it's not, I think that the impetus here is the way to read this is not the compulsion to make all bodies productive in a matrix like scenario, but rather to understand that, that all bodies are in some way differentially disabled. Um, they are, they, and this thing, instead of thinking of the disabled body as exceptional and irregular, to actually, in a way, think of it as no, actually as normative, it is a general and generic position. Uh, inclusive of all of those who believe themselves not to be disabled, but who nevertheless rely on technologies uh, other than wheelchairs to survive, such as agriculture, architecture, antibiotics, and so forth. So to avoid the miserable future in which urban computation is trained foremost on the optimization of arbitrary and banal aspects of human spatial logistics, such as parking and security and vending and so forth, surveillance, uh, a different understanding of automation I think is needed. First is one that understands that automation is not primarily about autonomy. And second, that globalization didn't cause automation Rather, automation caused globalization. And in the densest city or jungle, causality and determination is everywhere, but its processes are themselves indeterminate. So if one were to imagine these as dominoes, their arrangement extends deep into the heart of things. They are how cities work, and the agency of their cascade goes far beyond the intention of any first tipping. They're choreographed. Um, but they also evolve with each iteration, learning as they go, shaping and being shaped by the worlds in which they are situated. And as urban infrastructure, they remember, they encode specific decisions that can be repeated over and over. The superficial appearance of autonomy of a machine process of person is actually an illusion. So let me actually stop there. Um, I, I would like to probably put quite a lot on the table for us for uh, discussion, um, much more to share from this work, much more to talk about uh, in relationship to this, but um, I, I anticipate that the, as a, instead of adding more for us to discuss at this point, um, our gathering here, um, particularly because we're, I'm unfortunately remote from you all, would probably be better served by um, saving a little bit more of our time for conversation and for questions so that we can Probably discover something together. So thanks very much for your your attention to the work. Thanks a lot, Benjamin. Uh, I hope that uh, we all have some questions to ask because this is now the time. So either you can put your hands up, uh, maybe preferably with those little reactions uh, of this, the Zoom, or you can also post your question into the chat and I can read it loud. So feel free. It's time for digesting still. <laughs> yes, Miro. Hello. Thank you for, uh, uh, for the beautiful lecture. So I would just kind of have a, a few thoughts on what you were saying and, and form it as a question. So can we think for instance, of intelligence by distinguishing it from the notion of artificial and natural. So how do we think of, for instance, is this natural artificial still adequate? So what is, for instance, then a, a natural language? Can we think, for instance, of Latin as a lingua franca in the Middle Ages? Was this natural or was this artificial? Or for instance, how do we think of dialects in this way? Or can sure. we think, for instance, of mathematics as a language? And then is it artificial, natural, or synthetic? Then can we think, for instance, of computer languages as languages? And then if they are languages, do they have a, a kind of literacy within them? 
Yeah. So then this, just a little bit more, in the context of, uh, of intelligence then, what if we think, for instance, that here I, I would refer a little bit to, to Michel Sayer, where he says that uh, intelligence is coextensive with the universe. So then that we have, for instance, human intelligence, we have machine intelligence, we have the intelligence of the planets, the intelligence of the mountains, the intelligence of the crystals, of bacteria, and so on. And here his argument goes into the direction where he says that every living being stores, emits, receives, and processes information. But then he says as well that every mountain crystal or an object stores, emits, receives, and processes information. So on, on this sense, we could kind of think of them of having a certain agency or a certain intelligence, but then it's not clear, is it kind of artificial or, or natural? So in, in this sense, for instance, we could think of this on the level of communication, yeah? Communication, literacy, and so on. And I think what's interesting also today with the, for instance, with biology, what's happening with the, uh, with this gene editing and CRISPR and Cas9 and so on. So all of them are kind of in a way approaching the genes and, and these things through a, a kind of an understanding of, of literacy. So here I would kind of, I, I'm posing this just yeah. in a way to, to destabilize this idea of, of what is artificial and natural. Sure. Yeah, and I share. Thank, thank you for the question. And I share your. I, I, I count me in on the on the destabilization uh, project. Um, I, I, the way in which I would want to sort of pose these is for the purpose of of their, you know, playing with their limits and and coming to the point where we realize that the the, ter the terminology by which we might differentiate them in a certain sense um, isn't is no longer perhaps representing what we want it to represent as well as it as well as it should, um, which is another matter problem of language, as we would sort of say. But I, 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 your, your point about the, the artificialization of language, I mean, the beginning of writing is a kind of arguably a kind of beginning of an artificialization uh, of, of, of language in a, in a certain regard. The printing press is a different kind of artificialization of language in this regard. And certainly the spoken language has evolved in relationship to these artificializations. Um, the standardization of grammar, the standardization of typefaces, so forth and so on. These are all modes of, of artificialization. So I, I'm not at all suggesting that language existed in this kind of purely human social form independent of technicity. And then all of a sudden in, with cybernetics, it's been taken over by the machines or something. Not at all what I'm kind of suggesting. And, in that sense, I, I would, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I think it would be inappropriate to try to, to I think it would only useful perhaps to even use these words rather, you know, as rather slippery kinds of adjectives that we could describe the artificial qualities of something and the natural and the sort of organically emergent, the, the, like the ways, the structural forms of this that are emergent through their um, sort of historical dynamism of their use. These are both happen at the same time, and these if these words have any usefulness, it's to describe these processes that are simultaneous and overlapping and convergent in one way or another. So, um, I, I think part of the, the 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 this is in a way part of what has been, I think, clarified by the successfulness of large natural language processing models in being generative systems that we become that much more aware of the way in which the formalization and artificialization of language has in the past structured the possibility of our thinking in this way. I think, you know, Lacan was fascinated with cybernetics. Derrida wrote about cybernetics in the, you know, the early grammatological work. The idea that language itself is constructed through the artificial formal models that constrain the possibility of enunciation is also well known to, you know, to, deconstruction and in, in, uh, through, another, through another, another kind of method. Okay, to the second question, which um, I, I, Sarah is one of my favorite writers and thinkers. I have a lot of admiration for this, for, for this as well. I, I would, however, would want to save the question of intelligence for as not necessarily as ubiquitous of a, as a phenomenon as you might, as you, as, as you have just, you've described it here. It's for certain that we, that the, the, the kind of somehow a kind of metaphysical or Gnostic construction of language of, of intelligence, that it is something that is separate somehow from a physical 
material, even geological uh, footing or grounding is impossible. That yes, whatever intelligence we would want to recognize in ourselves and other animals and machining processes is, is of course not only something that the universe does, something that the planet does, but also something that in our genes do and something that our brains and central nervous system does. It's a physical phenomenon like digestion, uh, uh, our cognition in, in, in this way and, and so forth. So, so that physicality of it um, is, is for certain. I would want to specify, I think I probably would want to specify the notion of intelligence per se, differentiate it simply from information sensing, from information. Uh, and the ubiquity of, of information or the capacity at some molecular level for uh, entities to respond externally to the world around them. I think intelligence implies a kind of goal directedness. Um, I think it implies a kind of capacity for planning and modeling and discrimination um, and action uh, and goal directed action within a particular within a particular, in the particular system that's certainly not exclusive to humans. Um, but I think assigning that intelligence to, to rocks and mountains, not only is a slippery slope to a kinds of versions of panpsychism that are scientifically implausible, but also to forms of anthropomorphism that are, uh, that are uh, probably uh, not helpful in this regard. It, it allows us, it would, it's an invitation to, it's an invitation to attribution errors of, of assignments of agency and intentionality to things that don't have agency and intentionality in, in, in any kind of fundamentals that are interesting because they are not intentional in a way. Uh, the, you know, the ways in which our genes instruct cells to regrow themselves in particular ways and to become a liver cell or a neuron cell is not intentional. There isn't intention built into this there is arguably at a systemic level a form of intelligence, but I don't think the intelligence is in that is in that is in that process, is in that process itself. Um, but I, I think where I'm, I mean, we can debate this, and I think it all ultimately comes down to what we want to use this word to describe. We want to use the word intelligence to describe. Like we might agree that these phenomena are all the relevant phenomena, and then we can debate the kinds of nomenclature and glossary of terms that we need to compose in order to correspond to the phenomenon in a productive way. And I would, I would see right off the bat that the word intelligence is far too blurry uh, and low res to actually capture all of the kinds of things that we would, we would say. And so, I, but that would be my caution to not against the expansive use of the term rather, and rather towards a more specific, uh, you know, more appropriate 20th century neologisms that would allow us to be more precise. Um, in that in that way. So anyway, that, but the more I guess for me the more important distinction for some of the more recent work is I get as I mentioned between Solars's distinction between sentience and sapience, and the models of sapience that are based on a kind of recursive, a cursive a recursive modeling of of what's of, of mind. Like think of Graziano's theory of social consciousness, where you've got lots of animals that grow like predator and prey that evolve through having the capacity to model some external mind in some way. The predator is like the, the fox is hunting the mind, is modeling the mind of the thing that the fox is hunting in order to predict what it's going to do next. And this capacity for modeling the external mind is fundamental to many of these more advanced predator prey dynamics. In, same with the prey, it's trying to model the mind of the fox in order to know how to evade it and ultimately whichever one is better at modeling the mind or the other has some kind of evolutionary advantage. And so that's the, this mind modeling becomes part of the evolutionary arms race as much as camouflage does. What Graziano argues is that in the emergence of, is that what happens is that one of the things that humans are um, perhaps uniquely capable of, or at least uniquely facile with is this process by which we, this external, this modeling of the external mind bends back on ourselves and we begin, we start modeling our own mind. But that modeling of our own mind, which he identifies as the basis of consciousness, this internalization of the external modeling is evolutionarily just an extension of that process of the externalization. And so even one's own intimate, private, subjective, um, mental, you know, inner, inner monologue uh, with oneself is, is in this sense, a kind of othering of the self, of, of seeing oneself in this, in, in, as, as if one were an external form in this regard. 
in any event. Um, I, I think these are many of the things that we will want to sort of consider in relationship to whether or not, at what point machine intelligence might be recognizably sapient, at what point does it work in relation to these other sorts of things. But again, I would, on the one hand, open to the idea of, of a much more distributed understanding of where intelligent cognition operates in the world, but would want to avoid the panpsychism and anthropomorphism in its, in its more profane in its most, most, most profane sort of sense, because I think ultimately it leads to animism uh, which is, I think, in, scientifically indefensible, and ultimately, it's something that 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 imagines itself as being a non-anthropocentric view of the world, but actually, in many ways, is a hyper-anthropocentric view of the world. That the frog can't just be a frog; it has to be a totem animal within our social drama, and so forth, and so on. And so, this is a path that I hope we avoid. Thank you. Um, Jeff, you I guess the synthetic intelligence of Zoom is sorting out the hand. So, Giacomo, go ahead. Uh, hi, can you see me and hear me? Uh, I, I had a question in relation to, uh, for example, when you were talking about the gore of evolution, of human evolution. I was wondering whether in this system, for example, how would, would it deal with notions of conflict between let's say people, but also social conflicts, more or less what also James Bridle is discussing in his work. Uh, is it something that it's ultimately outside of the system or against this, this kind of system and synthetic uh, intelligence, or can it be dealt with internally? Because in a way you were in a way discussing this idea of, um, let's say a kind of a dialogue between the different parts. What happens when the dialogue is not working? How can we deal with it? In a way, well, you'll have to you'll have to tell me more what James what what asked what James more specifically the the what James is uh, might be using employing this oh, term. For, but, uh, but, but let me let me answer it in terms of his first question was how I was doing it. So I can that I can answer maybe more directly. And that is the example that I just gave in terms of the predator prey dynamics is uh, is a simple example of a way in which you have a kind of evolutionary condition by which there's a, a, a violent relationship between two species that co-evolve in relationship to each other and that the arc of uh, the arc of the evolution of intelligence of one in relationship to the other is dependent upon the capacity of each of them to become more intelligent in relationship to the world in relation to the other and the capacity of this external mind modeling in the ability to strategically predict what is likely to happen in the future, you know, prospective futurity, um, and to strategize in relationship to prospective futurity. So at a more fundamental level, we could think of that. But we also can think of this in terms of the history of military, uh, the, role of the, the, the role of not just military research more recently, but in the role of military technology as a driving force in technological innovation more generally, I mean, for some, this is a reason to reject these technologies because they are contaminated by this moment of this original sin of their military origins. For others, it's a way in which to sort of think about what you know the the the, the function of the military in a different kind of way. It's actually quite kind of interesting that it does this. The predicament in which we find ourselves now is that this is no that this and this is the main point is that this is no longer. It probably wasn't sustainable for a long time, but it's certainly no longer sustainable. Like we, we are at this point in what we think of as this Anthropocene moment where we recognize our humans recognize their agency in the world, that we created an anthropogenic ecology, an anthropogenically artificialized ecology, precisely at the moment where the we also simultaneously recognize that the ongoing viability of that ecosystem and that planetarity is at stake and that our own extinction, not to mention the extinction of other forms of life, becomes a real possibility. And so you have this kind of this paradoxical moment of enlightenment where we come to realize the condition of, we come to realize the evolutionary, the evolutionary parameters and conditions of the emergence of our own intelligence. The, we come to recognize the agency of the application of that intelligence in the form of the, in the form of the Anthropocene. And simultaneously, we come to recognize that unless this intelligence is able to find an, a different way in which to evolve and exercise itself that is not 
externally and internally destructive, that this intelligence will extinguish itself, that it will go extinct. And so it's we recognize our own the, the conditions of our intelligence, the agency of our intelligence, precisely in the moment when we recognize this intelligence might be disappearing on an astronom on an astronomic scale. And so the way in which I posit the violence is not is is on the one hand a kind, hopefully a kind of clear-eyed recognition of of how it has contributed to the emergence of natural intelligence, but also as a as a rather e equally clear-eyed admonition that it can't continue this way if it if it seeks if 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 it if it wishes to have a long term a long term future. I mean, Homo sapiens have been around for 150,000, 200,000 years or, or or so, and if we're going to be around for another 200,000 years or half a million years, um, that the that the condition that this this condition of of planetary violence will not be able to continue, and that's this was the point. Thank you. Yeah, but because I refer to to Bridal in the sense that, for example, the he's discussing, I think, quite thoroughly, uh, the relationship between the ones who own the means of production for this kind of intelligence, in terms of also of profit, and the ones who don't. And mm -hmm. I think he has a slightly, possibly, maybe more pessimistic view. Uh, is it something natural? It, it, would it happen naturally? that we get into this, let's say, more enlightening uh, condition, or is it something that uh, it needs conflict? So we should push it more on a, let's say, on a more political level. Oh, I think it definitely, I, I don't think, I don't, and not, not, don't at all think that the, only, that the only way in which we can organize planetary scale computation is by having monopolies by advertising companies. I, I don't think that that's, a, that, that that's a necessarily the, <laughs> that there's anything sort of that that, that is a, a, a kind of guaranteed deterministic outcome for how we would organize this in, organize the 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 economics and socialization of this infrastructure, but it also hasn't been the only way in which it's happened either. Um, I, I think just I, I I share the critique that I, sort of like the fact that you've got Facebook as being one of the main AI research areas is is in the long term probably detrimental to the to that long-term future of the human race, as it turns out. Um, but at the same time, I think it, it would be important not to make this, this sort of, let's say this premature ontologization error that I kind of described, that is like, that by confusing what AI is and is being used for at this particular moment with what AI is as an at intrinsically or in the, or, you know, in, in the very long term. Um, and this, and, and, and so I think the question of how it, Become something else, for sure. I, I'm not a, probably is not as much of a political determinist or social reductionist as as some others might be. That that ultimately a simple means of production analysis and and call for a political resolution of technological contradictions. I mean, my my approach is is, is less that ultimately technology is just a form of politics. Uh, my approach is more that politics is ultimately a form of technology. Uh, and that, po that political theory is becoming increasingly aware of the, the ways in which particular technical milieus make different forms of political organization possible or impossible in, di in, in, in different sorts of forms. But I would also, um, I, I, you know, there's a way in which the West tends to always think that the history of the West is the history of the world, uh, and that the history, is, and even the more recent history of the West is the history of the world. And, the history of, of infrastructural computation, of cybernetics, of algorithmic governance has a deep history in Russia, in China, uh, that is quite irregular, that's it been in conflict with itself. The Sino-Soviet split in the late 1950s, the role of the figure of cybernetics as, as within this split was quite decisive. Um, and I, I, I would be hesitant to make any general claims about the planetary career of algorithmic governance or of infrastructural computation by looking only at um, the front of my phone uh, and assuming that that's where, what it's all about. And but anyway, the history, this, 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 the particularly the Chinese and Russian history of this is totally fascinating, um, quite odd and contradictory, and one that I would, you know, I, I think that needs to be much more part of the conversation. 
not just in terms of how we imagine possible futures, but also in terms of we imagine how we got here and what the past is. I think the presumption that America or Western Europe's present is everyone else's future, no one, no one, no one agrees with this except maybe a few, a few Western critics. Thank you. Um, yes, sir. Thank you. Um, thank you for organizing as well. Uh, and thanks for the lecture. Um, I have a question about um, at the beginning of your, somewhere at the beginning of your talk, you said something like, uh, and I'm more or less freely interpreting this, um, that we should not try to make AI too graspable. Um, so, or, or to adjust too much together with it, uh, because it would too, put too many anthropocentric uh, restraints on the development of AI. Like if we try to interpret it all the time, um, we uh, would actually uh, restrain its development. Um, I'm, not sure, I'm not sure you put it quite that way, but... Yeah, probably. I, I forgot to write down exactly what you said. Um, yeah, anyway. In the context of what you said, um, I, um, I wanted to ask you about the concept of um, artificial agent or artificial agency. Um, do you think a concept like this could be useful um, or do you think a concept like that is too much uh, anthrop uh, is too anthropocentric and too much explaining uh, artificial intelligence in, uh, in our own terms, so to say? What, what, what do you mean by artificial agency? Help me understand what you what, what that might um, mean. I better comment. Uh, we'll give you answer. I am more or less, uh, I'm using it from uh, the context of uh, philosophy of technology, human computer interaction, uh, maybe even governance studies where they use it a lot to um, explain the artificial agent as, um, uh, for example, something people interact with, like a robot, mm -hmm. um, or in governance studies, maybe something that could um, uh, become an agent in, uh, in legal terms, for example. Right. Um, I, I know I, I see it, but it, it's, it's, it's complicated. Um, on the one hand, you know, we, we just had this interesting conversation in, in, with, the pre, with the students in the present conversation where we were talking about interfaces. And talking about the um, the way in which inter the interface, particularly human computing interfaces, and some of the history of this, and the way in which this history has has moved over the years, and, and the rough sketch that I drew was one that if you look at the early history of human computer interfaces in the fifties and sixties, they were ones that required quite a lot of expert knowledge about how the computer actually worked. Uh, load this into memory, run this from here, go to this as well, but like learning how to play a piano, you had to understand how the computer worked, how it functioned in order for the interface to allow you to give it instructions for what it is that you wanted to do. And as we all know, over the period of last generation, there have been the increasingly, these increasing sequence of, abs of abstractions, uh, a layer abstraction layers up to the point by which you don't have to know anything about how the way the computer works because so much of interaction design has become based on understanding how people think computers work uh, and designing interfaces so that computers will work based, whether, work based on how you think they work, not based on how they actually work, right? And so we have, we talked about we have files and folders and trash cans, we've had those for some time, but it's probably become even more uh, based on this as well. So if you think of it like, in this conversation, there may have been a 50-50, like the computer would meet us halfway, we meet the computer halfway, where we would work on it. Like it, we have to understand how it works, but it will explain how it works in, 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 in German or English buttons that we can push. Now, again, it's becoming increasingly that, you know, however it is that you imagine it works, that's the way it works, right? It doesn't, you know, or that's the way it will perform working for, for you. And I do, I do have some reservations about this because I, I, I think it's a little, you know, it's a, it's a more of a general problem interaction design, probably one more for AI interaction, human, human AI interaction design more generally is, and there's, because it comes with trade-offs. Like on the one hand, do you design human AI 
interactions based on how the AI actually works. So that the more you use the, the system, the more you use those interfaces, the more you, are, you learn how the AI works and you have greater agency over how it actually works because you understand how it actually works. And the end user is empowered, um, that is able to recursively recompose the network, reprogram the network in a way in which deliberate consciousness. And you have something like a kind of a more democratic and informed democratic remaking of the system because the end users are all capable of acting back upon it in a way that's informed uh, and, 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 and meaningful on the one hand. Uh, versus a system in which anybody can just can use the system immediately without any expertise, without anything, because the interface to the system is so successfully modeled based on our misunderstandings of how the system actually works. Right? That, this, that the system will wear the mask necessary that we feel comfortable talking to it on our, our own terms, which is in fact more democratic. The, for, the second one allows anybody to use a system whenever they want with no training. And so it's immediately available to all of us and we all participate in instantaneously, which will have the appearance of a more democratic system. The former would require this expertise which would allow for this, let's say, you know, training of the user in such a way that they would have more, they would be more empowered, which would give greater democratic agency. But you see the trade-off here and you see the problem with the way in which some of this works. Now, the idea of having an agent that acts on your behalf that says, you know, in semantic web people when trying this for a long time, but something that says, all right, I want to send, you know, I can act, you know, and you see how hard this is to do where even with, if, you guess, if I try to talk to my, talk to Siri and say, you know, make a calendar appointment for blah, 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 blah. Not the times, the amount of times you need to correct it in order for it to sort of be right, makes the whole thing sort of not worthwhile. But in any event, th this is the concern I have with the, with this sort of agency kind of thing as well. Like on the one, it, that, that there becomes, um, it's the, the concern is not with a docent, is not with a figure that is allowable to sort of externalize or prostheticize our intention into something that is roughly figural, so it allows us to understand it as an entity and to interact with an entity in some sort of way. My problem is with the black boxing of this, or my concern is with the black boxing of this in such a way that we become, that, that it leads to increasing ignorance and misapprehension of how these systems work because they, they, they're not they're working the way, they, the way we, you know, they're working the way we expect them to, not the way they really are. Um, and it's, 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 it's not a, not an easy question to, not an easy question to answer. Um, I, I, in a certain sense, perhaps the natural language, really, really good natural language processing interfaces may allow for both in that you both have something that we, uh, language as an interface, we both already intuitively know it. Anyone can just talk at the thing and it does what you want it to do, but it also, the thing may also be able to explain itself in ways in which you do understand a little bit of what's going on, where you can say, Siri, how do you work? Uh, and it will you know, tell you a little bit more of what's going on there, uh, that you don't need to pull up a command line interface in order to understand what's happening. I don't know, but you, you, see, you, see, the, you see the problem here. You know? Particularly because we're, we, we have this intensity for a kind of animistic imagination where we assign imaginary agency to things that don't have it, or we try to, organize or curtail or cast the agency of things within social semiotic dramas that exist only in our own heads, um, that the temptation to do this in relationship to AI is so great that I, I really think it's something we need to be concerned about. Okay, so Benjamin, would you accept one more question? There's one more hand. Yes, yeah, no problem. So yeah, maybe two more questions actually, if you're okay with it. Giacomo, please go ahead. Giacomo just left it on, I think. Okay, so then, Vadim, please. Mm -hmm. Yes, hello, Benjamin. Uh, thank you for the lecture. Um, I, I wanted to return to our uh, yesterday's uh, discussion about um, the factory and autonomy. Uh, and I, I, I wanted to ask you your opinion. Like, uh, if, if I remember, uh, yesterday you told that, uh, like, as a climate change modeling example, 
it works, uh, but it works uh, as something as an um, isolated environment. So while, while they're talking about like a, even, I don't know, city modeling, uh, various indicators, et cetera, like the predictability of it. Like when we are removing as uh, a person from a loop or reducing um, what's uh, behavior uh, possibilities, we, we are able to compute. Um, at the same time, uh, you had uh, a very interesting opinion uh, from, from my point uh, on a climate change recently. Uh, so I think in Twitter, you quoted uh, this movie, Don't Look Up, and you were talking uh, about climate change as something about like a hyper object, which is a process, if I uh, quote you correctly. So no, I, think, I, I, I think it's not helpful to call it a hyper object. Uh huh. Okay. And 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 in this okay. Uh, and in this case, I mean, uh, if you return to climate change modeling, for example, um, are you like uh, mm, supporting that uh, we, we are able to kind of uh, remove a person uh, from a co uh, computation, like uh, remove uh, the human behavior from a computation of a climate change, and and basically mm, convert uh, the climate change modeling into something like a process, but still predictable, or uh, it's more chaotic process that we cannot predict uh, through the modeling. No, it was more the second, I think. I, I, what, what I was talking about was, was having to do, just to catch everyone up a little bit in the conversation very quickly, having to do with the ways in which climate change models are based upon a kind of recursive prediction of the past. That the ways in which the and maybe sort of know this that you you take all this data from historical ice core samples and tree rings and all the rest of this kind of thing and that the way in which you you ensure that your model of the future of what 2050 is going to be like or what 2150 is going to be like is you use that model to predict the past that is you look at the data from let's say 1800 and you try to use your algorithm to try to predict what 1850 would would have been would be like and looking back at 1850 if you got it right then you feel confident that your algorithm, your algorithm to predict the future is probably good. And so with this prediction of the future in relation to the past. But what I was saying in terms of human involvement and human agency within this loop has to do with simply talking about the, the reason that the IPCC projections for climate futures are, are widely varied, uh, whether it's going to be three and a half degrees or 1.5 degrees is not because we don't have the statistical competence or computational capacity to calculate this well enough, but rather because the big variable within this is what humans decide to do. Do we decide to radically decarbonize or business as usual or whatever, which is not necessarily something you can measure. It's, it's it, it, in advance. It's something that would be, it is in essence, a, a political or infrastructural decision about what, what's going to happen there as well. So. I wasn't suggesting that we, uh, my point was not about the likelihood of taking humans out of the loop for climate modeling. My, suggest, my point was rather that humans are in the loop for the climate models, but that the loop is one that, that, that the humans are a chaotic agent within that model because we can't predict what they're going to do. And then that's what, make the, that's what makes the predictive models varied, but that I was also suggesting that one of the implications of climate science more generally that we are, and, and those who are interested in climate governance and actually you know, reducing carbon and taxing carbon and the rest of this are attentive to is the idea that these models of the future are, need to have political weight to govern the present. And that this recursion that the that models of the future must govern the present as a theory of algorithmic governance, as a theory of governance as such, is something that needs to be more explicitly articulated. I hope that was that was clear. Yes, that's, that's clear. That's the only one maybe uh, thing that I want to clarify. And in this case, like if we are observe uh, like a human human behavior as a, like a chaotic object, so uh, unpredictable one, uh, how uh, you are defining their. Um, like an algorithmic governance of the city. So I was quite inspired by your work um, that uh, called the city versus. And um, uh, uh, there I, I see the loop, but I don't see governance. Uh, so because uh, in a symbiotic relationship, like uh, in a synthetic relationship, 
I don't see governance. So I, I mean, in, in this case, can you, maybe you can define how the governance works in this case. I'm, I'm sorry, in, uh, could you, in which case do you not see governance? What was the uh, case? As I, I, I understood in a, like a paper, uh, city versus us. Uh, city versus us. Yes. Um, uh, you, you, mm -hmm. Yeah, so, that, yeah. That, I, so fair enough. I, I, I don't think that particular paper or the scenario, I mean, what that paper was sort of more looking at was the ways in which thinking about the the way in which the current evolution of AI is direct is is in such a way that AI is it, it not just applied to the city, but it is increasingly embodied as the city, and as a massively distributed array of sensors of my, of, of small sensors, tactical direct algorithms, infrastructural algorithms, and so forth and, and so forth and so on. But that the, it is its embodiment is at urban scale. Right, and so it's a shift in perspective. I think from seeing the question of here is the city, and I'm like the, the shift in perspective from the smart cities discourse, which as I see it is like here is a city which has certain kind of well understood requirements, and we're going to drop AI on top of it, like butter, and it's going to automate these functions and processes in such a way. But I, I I'm the argument is a little bit more like perhaps the a kind of jungle that you've got lots and lots of different species sensing and modeling and predating and seeing and camouflaging from one another. And that AI machine vision, machine sensing is dropped into this as, as, as new kinds of invasive species that will affect the ecological relationships between the other ones that are, that are there. And so the, 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 and that many of the things that it's seeing and looking at and hiding from won't will be other other AIs, not us. We're not necessarily the protagonist of this situation. And whereas in smart cities, it's always the you know individual pedestrian protagonist. So that was the topic of that piece. The top that that the that piece didn't address. You're right. That piece doesn't really address the question of governance uh, of that per se. Um, though it doesn't certainly doesn't exclude it. Uh, it certainly doesn't exclude it either. Um, Generally, I mean, the way in which I define governance here is, is a little bit, it has to do with this kind of sapience question of it's governance can be defined as all the ways in which a complex system is able to self model itself and act back upon itself recursively in relationship to that model. Right. So it's the governor, like the governor function within cybernetics. It's how it is that, the, again, how the system, complex system can model itself and act back upon itself according to that model. That's governance, it, which can take place in lots of sense. It's not necessarily something that's, it's not only something that states do. It's not only something that laws do. It's not only something that protest does. It's, it's kind of, it's, it's something that complex systems do. But, you know, our political institutions are ways in which, you know, and it, you know the edges of the network in the form of democratic representation collectively model the whole and allow the whole to act back upon itself by collectivizing this intelligence in principle. So that counts as governance, but it's not the only kind of governance that would be that we should be considering. Yeah, thank you. The recursivity idea is very interesting. And I, when, when I read uh, the paper, I thought about like an uh, external control, but you're talking about like a cybernetic internal control, which is, for, for my opinion, it's interesting. Okay. Yeah, but again, I hope I hope what I mean is in the sense like I'm not suggesting a cybernetic control necessarily as an alternative to yes, yes, understood. traditional modern political systems. What I, I guess mm -hmm. it's more like it, recognizing the model modern political systems as through the lens of the cybernetics, right? That you know a democracy is a is a form of political organization tuned towards edge recursion, where at the edges of the network, individual agents within the network form an aggregate model and aggregate recursion that that is a, that you know and it, it works quite well so it's again it's not because it's always misunderstood like it's like it's somehow as if this is being proposed as an alternative to politics it's not an alternative to politics it's a expansion of the political technical mm -hmm. domain the way in which we so, think so about it, it, yeah. it's a kind of a symbiotic politics, right, where we have a people's decision making and also an algorithmic recursivity, which is kind of connected. Well, we do that all the time. I mean, that's, what law, that's what laws are in a certain lens, right? We sort of build rule, we build rules within the game and rules of the system that algorithm, potentially algorithmically enforce themselves, right? If you do this, then that. If you don't do this, then that. These are 
laws are in a certain sense, you know, complex if then statements uh, that we've been organizing ourselves based on some time. It's just, you know, we, we've, got, we've got faster ways of programming and, and more granular ways of programming those if then statements than simply voting on people to go to a building to write them down on a piece of paper. Right. Okay. Thank you, very interesting. Vadim and Benjamin can continue the conversation tomorrow because Vadim okay. sent his PhD. <laughs> okay. But maybe for now, we can just say thank you so much, Benjamin, for the very amazing lecture and also okay. for all the questions and the listening. So thanks for the audience. I can see that we are from all over the world. Also, thanks for our YouTube audience. Um, and... Um, the YouTube, uh, so the recording will be staying on YouTube at the IARC channel. So everybody will be able to rewatch it. And otherwise, I think we wish you a very nice uh, evening, Benjamin, a nice day. Thank uh, you. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for the invitation and for uh, excellent questions and conversations. So I look forward to speaking with you all tomorrow and, and hope, again, I wish, I wish I could have visited you in person, but we're, we're all hopefully soon. So thanks again. Thank you so much. Bye, everybody.